platform and how to join to interact with your peers across the portfolio. So with that, I'm going to go ahead and kick it off to Feline to start us off this morning. Great. Thank you. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, I'm here to welcome you to our Voices with Vision webinar with our 2020 Vision Capital team and two remarkable GPs in our portfolio, Brian and Monique. Uh, my name is Feline Housing. I am a principal on our investment team, but have also been involved with building out the Vision Capital Fund over the last three years. Before we dive into today's conversation, I'd like to just set the stage uh, for this team and our work. Three years ago, Insight made commitments to driving diversity within Insight for our portfolio and across the investing ecosystem. Software and technology are thriving sectors in societal adoption and in business influence. Insight is a core investor in this ecosystem, and we need the software and VC industry to reflect a society that we aspire to, one that is inclusive to all. Specifically, Insight launched 2020 Vision Capital based on the premise that fund managers from underrepresented backgrounds have the opportunity to create outsized returns for LPs and create positive change in the broader VC ecosystem. Vision Capital specifically aims to address the historical lack of LP funding to these underrepresented GPs by investing and partnering with them as they build their firms. Our team supports managers from inception, allowing fund managers to utilize Insights GP connections, gain exposure to additional investors, and have access to strategic programming like advisory support and briefing sessions on the state of the industry. Over the past three years, Insight has hosted a variety of curated in-person and digital events, including roundtables and networking sessions to contribute to the, excuse me, to the success of the fund managers. Um, since we began investing three years ago, we've invested in over 20 emerging fund managers and are excited to partner with more in the coming years. To support the growth of this work, we're excited to have brought on Samer, who will help us scale the strategy and the impact of the Vision Capital Fund. Prior to joining Insight, Samer was the CEO at Black BC, the professional organization for Black venture investors. With that, I will kick it over to Samer to lead the discussion with our panelists. Amazing. Thank you, uh, Feline, Danya, for, for pulling this together. Um, as Feline mentioned, I'm Samer Youssef. I recently joined um, Insight's Vision Capital Fund uh, a little bit about two months, two and a half months ago now. Uh, specifically working very closely with Feline, Dion, other folks on the, the Vision Capital team on how do we not only think through how do we scale this fund of funds, but how do we think through from a, a larger kind of like support perspective, how do we support our portfolio funds, how can we get not only our capital, but additional capital flowing to these managers that are having an outsized influence on the ecosystem. Um, for those of you that are now just coming becoming familiar with Juneteenth. Uh, just as a quick refresher, it's a it commemorates the kind of final emancipation of slaves um, that were freed about two and a half years prior to the news finally getting to them. The final slaves being in Galveston on June 19, 1966, and so or 1866. Apologies. Uh, and obviously, it's a celebration, um, but also um, a recognition, right? Of of how slow change can be, as well as how consistent we have to be as those that care about this effort um, in trying to consistently move the needle, um, hold power to account uh, and tracking progress. And so um, in that thought and in that, um, that kind of ethos, we wanted to pull together this specific conversation, um, specifically around not just highlighting and spotlighting two incredible managers, but also understanding the journeys um, that have led to that. Um, as, as Feline mentioned, um, most recently I was at Black BC, the fresh organization for Black venture investors, and we're actually joined by one of our founding board members, Brian, who, who I'll introduce shortly. Uh, but one of the reasons I wanted to join the LP side and really focus on mobilizing capital is that as we were doing a lot of research and published state of Black venture report, uh, the same challenge kind of kept arising that there's just this dearth of LP capital backing a lot of uh, underrepresented emerging managers, specifically Black managers in the ecosystem. Uh, today, about 4% uh, of all investment partners uh, at firms are Black. Um, about 7% of junior talent identify as Black as well. Uh, and that limited amount of investors is also reflected on the founder side. You know, uh, a crunch-based report recently came out that in Q1 of 2023, um, Black founders received less than 0.7% of VC funding. Uh, that's a, down by about half compared to Q1 of 2022. And so if we're thinking about it from a holistic perspective, how do we start to move the needle and make venture a little bit more um, inclusive? Uh, we have to start with the GPs, right? And, and something that is promising, and I'm, part of the reason why I'm really excited for this conversation, aside from just having two incredible speakers with us, is that 
um, black fund managers specifically are having an outsized influence on the ecosystem. You know, we we found in the human capital survey done by NBCA that black managers are four times more likely to back uh, black entrepreneurs than their non-black peers. They're also exponentially more likely to be mentoring and hiring um, underrepresented talent and nurturing that next stage that's coming up. Ultimately, you know, I believe that uh, managers like Cake and Collide. Um, are going to be not just at the forefront of returns um, and then covering incredible companies that are going to be defining society, but also going to be having a positive impact outside of that. Um, and I led with the point of returns because ultimately that is the goal of the Vision Capital Fund. And that's the goal for these two managers and, and all the managers that we've backed, right? The, the underlying argument being we can create change and make money while doing it. Um, so with that being said, I'm really excited to introduce the, the two speakers that we have today. I'll be, give a quick background, but I'd love for both of y'all to, to hop in and give additional information. I'll start with Brian, uh, who I met now about three years or so ago. Um, Brian Hollins is a founder and managing partner of Collide Capital, an early stage venture fund investing into companies across enterprise SaaS, supply chain infrastructure, and Gen Z minded consumer software. As I mentioned earlier, he's a founding board member of Black VC. And he's also the founder of Takeoff Institute, which equips uh, Black undergraduate students with the resources and mentorship needed to launch successful professional careers. Monique Woodard is a founder, is the founder and managing director of Cake Ventures, an early stage venture fund investing into companies that reflect the changing demographics, including in aging and longevity, uh, increased spending power of women, and the shift to majority minority. Uh, prior to that, Monique was a venture scout for Lightspeed Venture Partners and a venture partner at 500 uh, startups. So the I feel like that that's only a drop in the bucket of, of y'all's journey and all that you've accomplished. So Monique, I want to hand it over to you quickly to, to share a little bit more color about your journey. Uh, tell us more about Cake Ventures, how you came to launch the fund and, and where you are today. Sure, so um, someone reminded me the other day that I basically started four companies in my career and so uh, I think essentially at the core of what I am as an entrepreneur, now I'm just an entrepreneur who sits in the venture capital seat and has started her own fund. Um, so, you know, I started my first company when I was very soon out of college um, and then, you know, started a couple of companies, moved to San Francisco. I'm still in the Bay Area um, in 2008 and realized that, uh, that there weren't very many Black entrepreneurs at the events that I was going to, the demo days, the meetups, et cetera, that were so prevalent and so have always been such a big part of like building community in Silicon Valley. And so I decided to start um, a community of founders called Black Founders. And through that, I realized as I started, you know, interacting with founders, introducing them to the investors that I knew, and I realized that they weren't getting investment at the same rate that I thought they should be getting investment. And so that's what really led me onto the investor side of the table. Um, my first job in investing was at 500 Startups, now called 500 Global. Um, I was investing out of the San Francisco Seed Fund and also you know, did some investing in Sub-Saharan Africa. Um, and then ultimately, and I always knew this was on my path, I decided that I wanted to start my own fund. And um, I decided to start Cake Ventures. We did our first close in 2021. And I knew that I had a thesis around demographic change that could really stand the test of time and be not just a fund, but a franchise. Um, and, you know, really started to like put, put some stakes down on owning that, that sort of white space that I saw in the venture capital industry. Um, and so we're investing out of a uh, $17 million fund one. Um, we're about 14 investments in. I just committed to a new investment this week. so about 14 investments in and um, investing in seed and pre-seed companies that we find exciting uh, across consumer, FinTech, healthcare, but all related to this demographic change thesis that is the backbone of Cake Ventures. Amazing, and congratulations on closing that investment. Uh, really excited to hear that. Thank um, you. Brian, we'd love to get your background as well. Sure, um, originally from Washington, DC, um, I went to Stanford for undergrad. That was really my first exposure to uh, what I'll call Sand Hill Road, innovation, technology, um, this notion that you should go and throw things against the wall. And if they don't stick, you should you should throw more stuff. Um, that certainly wasn't the mindset that I was brought up on. 
um, right outside right outside of DC, um, but one that has certainly stuck with me as as an entrepreneur now. Um, I spent uh, seven years at Goldman Sachs in a variety of different capacities after I left Stanford, um, the first in a wealth management capacity. So learned capital markets, learned how money moved. Um, I remember very early on, about a year in, I was moving $100 million of bonds and, and no one was checking it. And, and I thought that that was fascinating. Um, and so really learned a lot about asset allocation and portfolio management. Um, about three years into my time at Goldman, I was tapped to build a new group for the firm called the Emerging Entrepreneurs Coverage Group. The core thesis of that group was that Goldman does a really good job for you when you're ready to raise $100 million and pretty much does nothing for you before then as an early stage entrepreneur. And so I was based um, in the San Francisco office and three days a week, I'd get in an Uber and I'd go to Sand Hill Road and I'd meet with GPs at Bessemer, Benchmark, Lightspeed, Sequoia, NEA, you, you name it, and uh, and ask them what Series A companies they had that were doing well and how I could be a conduit of access to Goldman for them and get them access to Goldman's resources ahead of where they traditionally could do it on their own. And so in that role, I didn't have check writing capacity, but I learned a tremendous amount about how to add value to founders in ways outside of just giving them money um, and, and learned a lot about the relationship building exercise that goes into that as well, the trust building, et cetera. Um, wanted to build a check writing capacity as well. So left that group to join the merchant banking division and did enterprise software investing off of Goldman's balance sheet for about two and a half years. Um, you started to mention Black VC. I think very similar to, to the story and anecdotes that Monique gave. We were, we were both in the Bay Area and uh, could see each other from across the room because we were the only ones that looked like each other. And so got together with a group of friends and started an organization called Black VC um, to really help power what I'll call the bottoms up initiatives that we see today in venture. How do you put butts in seats? How do you put people at analysts, associates, just kind of get them in the door? I think we woke up a few years later and recognized that 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 wasn't going to change much and that we needed to also start to build top down initiatives. And so we started um, a new initiative that Samer was 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 very instrumental in helping drive, which was called the Black Venture Institute where we started to train black tech executives on how they could become angel investors and effectively create synthetic friends and family rounds for founders of color uh, who don't have rich aunts and uncles. Um, but if you were seven years at Google or eight years at Slack and a person of color, we could train you to write 25 and 50K checks and start to drive those checks into interesting founders. Um, today, I think we've graduated 150 or, or 200 fellows through that program and very proud of the work that's being done there. Um, but I, I was ready to uh, to become a capital allocator. Um, so I left the firm in 2019, uh, went to Harvard Business School and spent two years really building the proof of concept for what is now Collide Capital. So uh, my partner's name is Aaron Samuels. Um, Aaron is a co-founder and COO of Blavity. Uh, today, Blavity is the largest black media company in the world. Um, it powers five different, five different digital properties. One of those is Afrotech, uh, which is the largest black tech conference in the world. And so very, very glad to have, um, you know, just a, just a, what, what I'll call a complimentary skill set. I've been an investor uh, my whole life and, and Aaron's been an operator for the majority of his. And so we came together to build Collide to help to drive capital into the ecosystems that we've sort of stood up and, and helped support uh, throughout our careers. So Collide Capital is a $66 million fund one. Uh, we closed it in the second half of last year um, and we're deploying out of that vehicle today. We write about a 750K check. Um, and our three kind of core focuses, Sam, you started to, to allude to our, our fintech, uh, the supply chain and logistics software, and, and a little bit of a thesis around Gen Z in the workforce. Amazing. I appreciate that overview. And, and it's been incredible to see how far the Black Venture Institute has kind of come. Uh, you know, I think they're, we're actually sitting at about 280 graduates at this point. Oh. And so many of whom have gone on to launch funds, join funds, et cetera, and seeing that catalytic um, network has been really, uh, really fulfilling. Um, I want to dive into strategy a little bit. Uh, I know, Brian, I'll start with you. You know, Collide, as the name suggests, and you kind of alluded to, is really the combination of two different ecosystems, right? Bringing this media uh, kind of like conglomerate that uh, that Aaron was building and your side from the investor side with Black BC also would take off in the suit in terms of this next generation. Um, as y'all were building Collide, how did you end up landing on the specific investment thesis and how do those two kind of uh, overlapping but separate communities help you source and, and really provide post-investment support for those portfolio companies? Yeah, it's a good question. I, I think part, you know, 
one of the things I look back on that I uh, appreciate having happened to me was looking at the challenges of early funds when I was helping stand up Black VC. Um, there were a lot of emerging managers that were struggling to raise capital. And I kind of said to myself, rather than getting in that line, what are the things I can do over an 18 month period to set us up for success? Um, and so we raised what we've eventually now call Fund Zero for Collide Capital. So we raised a $1.3 million fund. Uh, for those that aren't familiar with scout funds, we cobbled together four different scout vehicles. So we got an allocation of capital from four venture firms and um, you know, went above board to all four of those firms and asked for their blessing to aggregate that capital and effectively turn it into a proof of concept vehicle. And so we wrote 25 and 50K checks over an 18 month period uh, ended up making 34 investments, had 10 of those companies get marked up and had three of them get acquired. And so to, to your question around how we got to the thesis, I think we we looked around at one, where we were finding access, but two, maybe more importantly, where we were qualifying talent. So of the up rounds of the companies getting acquired, where did we have a unique foresight and vision into the types of businesses that were being built? And so that helped us really build our thesis. And I, I think to your second question, we've always been ecosystem builders. Um, Aaron and I have a knack for it. We've both done it for you know over a decade. We like getting people together. We like sharing resources. We like breaking down barriers um, and democratizing access for people. But uh, I think we were frustrated with the fact that you know you know Sam, you 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 gave some numbers on Juneteenth. I think you could have read the 2019 numbers, and no one no one would have batted an eye. It's been very frustrating to watch the lack of progress on some of those stats that you read off. And so we. We sort of challenged ourselves to say, uh, we built the largest, you know, black tech conference in the world. We want we built one of the largest black investor ecosystems in the world. How has none of this changed? And and our thesis is that the capital allocator hasn't changed. And so we wanted to build a venture capital firm that allowed us to be the check writer because we fundamentally believed that the capital would start to flow into the hands of the right people. Uh, today we've made forty six investments together. 84% of those founders are, are black Latin or female led teams. And so, you know, you can go to our, our website and, and see the proof of the work. We don't put our logos, we put our founders faces for, for a reason. And so definitely believe that those ecosystems will continue to drive our, our deal flow and sourcing mechanisms for the future. Uh, and I love that. And I think ultimately kind of um, spotlighting how you're not only identifying these, uh, these founders, these are just incredible founders in general. Right. And so, by getting that first check from y'all, by getting that first check from a Cake Ventures that then helps set them up for success in the Series A and beyond, um, there's just additional proof points and representation of what winning can look like in this space, right? And so um, we're obviously, so Monique, I want to change it over to you. And I feel like um, I've talked to so many people that have been mentored by you, that read your materials regularly, that have essentially kind of been able to model their careers and venture off of what you've been, uh, off of what you've been able to do. Um, specifically, though, I want to dig into um, part of your strategy because you spend a lot of time doing thesis work and really uncovering, you know, where you see the opportunities. I know you just recently published a piece on just demographic change in the trillion dollar female economy. It'd be great to get just at first, it's the high level of kind of like um, what cake means and kind of like those levels, but then maybe specifically diving into that vertical and what you're really excited about. So I know it's fresh in your mind. I think you might be muted, Monique. Thank you. Um, when I started Cake Ventures, I look back at my investing track record as an angel investor, you know, my track record at 500 startups and the investments that I had done at Lightspeed as a scout and realized that what I was investing in all along was demographic change. And so for the purposes of Cake Ventures, there are three big layers of demographic change that I focus on. The first layer is aging and longevity. There are 10,000 people turning 65 every single day in this country. This massive opportunity to help people age in place or think about uh, what the future of work looks like beyond retirement. Uh, the second layer of the cake, which you spoke about just now, we released a white paper called the Trillion Dollar Female Economy. Um, you know, The female consumer is driving companies to billion dollar plus outcomes across categories like healthcare and consumer and also B2B. And then finally, the last layer of the cake is the increased, um, the shift to majority minority uh, in the United States, uh, where people of color become the majority in the US and are already a global majority. Um, and so, you know, I think 
one of the things that is important to Cake Ventures is really contextualizing and explaining what demographic change really means. Um, I wrote our first white paper, uh, Gray New World, which is all about the opportunities around the aging demographic uh, before I even you know, had done the first close on Cake Ventures. And so now that we've done we did, we've done our final close on Cake Ventures. I released the second layer of the Cake White Paper, which is the trillion dollar female economy, which kind of dives into uh, how women became a growth market and what categories and what sort of technology tailwinds are driving this category and driving uh, companies in it to build big billion dollar plus outcomes. Um, uh, and insights is a really important part of the, the strategy around Cake Ventures. Um, you know, we'll, we'll be doing additional insights. We have a new paper around aging that we're working on with, um, we're collaborating with a, another fund on that. And um, it's just something that I think is really important. One drives a, a lot of our deal flow to really help to educate other VCs, um, you know, corporations, uh, other partners around what does demographic change mean and, and contextualizes a lot of these companies. Um, and it's just really important to the work that we do to help founders in particular understand how demographic change will accelerate or impact their business. Because uh, my belief is that at the core, every single business will in some way be touched by demographic change and will be accelerated by the demographic changes that, that we focus on. No, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And I'd love to double click into that, actually. Um, yeah. Is there a company in the portfolio that I feel like you that really kind of exemplifies this um, this ethos? Well, all of them. <laughs> but that fair is enough, the fair enough. <laughs> <laughs> but <laughs> I mean, I'll pick out one from, uh, you know, the trillion dollar female economy that we're very excited about. LA Health is a recent investment. They've developed a saliva test for the continuous monitoring of hormones for women. So applications across contraception, fertility, and then menopause later in life. So the thing to notice about LA Health is that it touches more than one layer of the cake, um, which you know some of the companies do. So not the companies are not necessarily siloed into one layer. Occasionally they have applications across multiple layers. Um, and we were just really excited by uh, the focus on hormonal health and the marrying of both science and technology. I think that a lot of products out there on the market that really that really wanna solve things like menopause, contraception, fertility, um, take a light touch around the science. And my belief is that software alone can't really do it. It has to be a combination of the two things of, of science and technology. Um, and so that's one example of a company in my portfolio that touches um, the female layer of the cake. Another one is Pamper Nails, called the Internet's Nail Salon, led by uh, a CEO influencer with over 2 million TikTok followers. And she's built a massive business of over 500 and 99 nail artists. And she's doing a massive amount of revenue in that company, um, raising a Series A soon. Outside of my, my portfolio, I would highlight companies like Incredible Health, um, super strong company in the healthcare space, um, sort of a... a, a you know, a labor marketplace for um, for nursing and, and skilled, nurse, skilled nurses. Uh, but also, you know, if you look at the B2B opportunity, there's a ton of opportunity in B2B also, like companies like FAIR, which is um, a marketplace for uh, online sellers to connect with distribution points. And that is a B2B company that is a unicorn a couple of times over. Um, so these companies are companies that have always been in plain sight. Um, investors have always been investing in them. Uh, and they've always been, you know, having these massive outcomes. Now, I think that what Cake does is put a wrapper and say, look, this is a thesis that we can stand up a firm on for the years to come. And, you know, we expect to have, you know, several IPOs out of out of uh, our our firm over time. And, you know, this is just the beginning of, of, I think, owning that white space around demographic change. Amazing, thank you. And um, Brian, I wanna change it over to you. Uh, and obviously, I mean, I, I think you mentioned 45 plus portfolio companies, so I'm sure a lot exemplify the Collide uh, kind of approach, but if there was one company you wanted to call out that you are really excited about, uh, please share. 
I love all my children equally, Samer. Um, I th I think um, you know we've 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 made investments in a in a in a few different buckets. I think one that's done a good job of exemplifying um, maybe why we were excited and and why others weren't and didn't pick it up until you know now it's too late. They're on a Series B. Um, it's a company called Reaply. Um, Reaply is a Chicago-based uh, company run by uh, a, a black CEO named Gary Cooper. Um, Reaply is a hard asset exchange manager. So um, today, think about recycling anything from a tractor trailer to a paper clip. How do you move it effectively, efficiently, transparently across the country? A use case that really drove the business um, where we got excited was um, Mayor Lightfoot, the mayor of Chicago during the PPE crisis. Uh, they raised their hand and said, look, we, we actually don't have a PPE shortage. We have a PPE distribution crisis. We have it in a ton of, we have it in a few places and have a lot of it. We need to get it out to other places. And originally Gary's technology was designed to, you know, allow scientists to move beakers and vials from, you know, NIS to something on, on the West coast. Um, he raised his hand and recognized his technology could actually facilitate that type of movement as well. Um, it drove a ton of adoption for the business. It was a great use case for the city. It was a great use case for him to show that he could work uh, sort of intergovernment in, within, the, within the government, as well as in an enterprise use case. Um, we've participated since the, the pre-seed um, the, and the business just raised um, a series B uh, from Revolution. And so, you know, it fits pretty squarely into our supply chain and logistics um, bucket. Um, but I think maybe more importantly was a business that, you know, struggled to raise early on and that people couldn't fully wrap their head around. And I think, you know, mostly is because sometimes these founders aren't the ones that you meet coming out of YC or they're not on your, you know, LinkedIn, you know, top 20 fastest growing things. And it's our job to go and identify those founders and hopefully put capital into them before the rest of the world identifies them. And that that's definitely one of those use cases for us. Uh, I love that. I remember actually meeting Gary Cooper. He was speaking up specifically about this pivot at the Chicago Venture Summit. And it's yep. great seeing kind of like the ability to repurpose and move quickly um, in a time that actually had a really meaningful impact on a lot of folks' lives. I uh, appreciate you sharing that story. Um, I, I want to shift a little bit to kind of talking about the impact just of, of Black fund managers in general and um, specifically kind of on y'all's journeys um, to this point. Um, this is a mentorship, apprenticeship based business, you know. Fortunately, there aren't many of us, but from what I've seen, there's a, a high level of interconnectivity uh, and, and support and competition at the same time. Um, I'd love to just kind of hear, as y'all are building out your brands and building out your firms, um, were there any funds or um, leaders that you wanted to model after or to kind of help took you under your wing as you were building out and establishing both of your respective firms? Monique, you want me to start? Yeah, no, I can, I mean, I'll jump uh, in. Yeah. So I would definitely say that, you know, Kirsten Green was a person that I, uh, who runs Forerunner Ventures was a person that I modeled Cake Ventures after. You know, I think uh, I've learned a ton from Marlon at Mac Venture Capital. We've done a number of deals together, starting with Blavity when I was still at 500 Startups. Um, and, you know, we've continued doing deals together over the years under many different, many different umbrellas. And so you're right. I think that, you know, as black investors, as women investors, we like to collaborate a lot together and it, it ends up being very collaborative, occasionally competitive, but that's obviously the game. Um, you know, the thing that I would say that I occasionally think about and worry about, you know, there was this Harvard HBS study that said that uh, companies uh, what female-led companies that are only invested in at the seed by women-led investor, women-led investor, uh, investor funds have a harder time raising follow-on capital. And while they didn't, you know, give the stats, they didn't do the study around black founders. Uh, anecdotally, I know that that can also be true for black founders. And so I think the thing that I would like to say to, you know, the people in the room today is that. Black fund managers are doing these tremendous layups to like invest in and identify these amazing black led companies, right? And we need a bigger community of support around the companies that we are finding as they reach series A, as they reach series B, as they reach growth. Um, and I think that's one of the things that that insight hopefully delivers is 
that community of support that can really support these fund man these fund managers in their journeys, but also support the underlying companies as they move into you know bigger and bigger rounds. Sam, you want me to answer the same question? Yeah, I had some uh, reflections, but please answer first. Yeah, I, I was going to say we could double click on a lot of that. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll give you two that um, sort of come top of mind. Just as I think, if I start mentioning mentors, I'm going to leave twelve out, so I'm not. I'm going to. I'm going to stay away from that. But just two funds that I think we've tried to model. One's called Six Four Five Ventures. Um, just in terms of a, a, a vision of where we could go, um, they built a they built a fund zero. Then they built a fund one, they built a fund two, they're now on fund three. Um, I think strategically, they've done a really good job sort of owning an ecosystem. They're New York based, they have a big presence here, uh, phenomenal LP base. So we've we've definitely tried to model or at least aspire to model their LP base. They brought in a, 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 tier, a tier one sort of signal endowment, which I think drove a lot of consistency and stickiness in their LP base. You know, I, I think that that's something people take for granted. Um, one of my anecdotes right now is that everyone wants a fund until they get one. Um, I think a lot of people recognize actually that they just want to be investors once they get a fund. And what they don't realize is that Monique and I have 17 other jobs that have absolutely nothing to do with picking companies. And so um, I think that that's something that I've really recognized is it's really, it's really helpful if you can build an LP base around you that sort of underwrites you for two to three funds on day one, instead of just writes a fund check because they saw you on Twitter. Um, the second fund I'd say is a little more of an aspirational fund. Um, I think a lot of people will mention a Sequoia or, or an Andreessen. Um, one of our aspirational funds is actually General Catalyst. So David Fialco and Joel Cutlub and, and the team there um, have just done an exceptional job acquiring talent. I, I think that that's actually one of my key roles now as GP and leader of Collide is to make sure that we surround the firm with people that are just way smarter than us. Um, and I think... Uh, I think the best investors at GC are not the are not the founders. Um, I think the best um, sort of hungriest and hardest workers are not the founders. Um, and I think the talent that they've brought in is exceptional and has really allowed them to be a, a, a multi generational fund now. And I think unlike many other firms that get to their size, I think that their transition is fairly secure. I think that they will do a great job transitioning the firm once once the founders leave. And so that's something aspirational also for us is that I hope that when when Aaron and I are done or, or don't want to do it anymore, I, I certainly hope that Collide is still around and, and still still performing. Um, so those are those are two funds I'd point to. Amazing. And, and 645 is also a portfolio fund as well. And so uh, yeah. I had the privilege of attending their AGM recently and, and seeing just how much they've scaled and like the structures that they've been put in place is really impressive. Um, I, I have a follow-up on just kind of like roles and what does it actually mean to be a GP, but there was one point I want to double click into that Monique made around um, just kind of like the continuum of capital and, and where we do see a gap for a lot of diverse founders. Um, Obviously, as as GPs, like you you won't you invest in your sweet spots, but um, something that uh, we found through the State of Black Venture report is is really just kind of this cliff once you reach the A, um, and especially in the B and, and beyond for for black fund managers. And there's a few that are rising that I think that are starting to kind of fill that gap of 645 and ANSA. But I'm curious about, you know, how what you think the ecosystem needs to, to have just kind of a, a more robust continuum of capital. So there is a hand out there, right? And obviously insights of the world are here to, to also invest into the best companies, um, but we just need more, right? And so just curious for y'all's y'all thoughts. And Monique, I'll throw it back to you first since you brought it up. Sure, I think it's it's, you know, it's more collaborators and more collaboration and a community of support around both fund managers and companies. Um, you know, I think, I think some people try to sort of outsource their investments in black, but into black uh, led companies in by into black funds. So like they say, Oh, I, I, you know, I know this black fund manager you need to meet. Right. As opposed to saying, I want to do this deal. Um, you know, let me bring along a bunch of funds just but just as I would for any other deal. Um, and I think, you know, we need to be more um strategic around that, right? I think a lot of funds need to just do a better job of investing in and nurturing the black um the black CEOs and founders inside their funds and 
you know, be more collaborative with black led funds. Um, and so, you know, I think I have a really good network, but it can always be better. Um, and I think I'm very lucky in that I do have that network and can, you know, mobilize that network to invest in the companies that are in my portfolio. But I think, you know, what I'm talking about is a, a much more sort of widespread issue um, across, you know, the entire industry. Yeah, I'd point to the sort of consistency of communication for us. That that's something that I learned a lot about from my growth equity seat. I, you know, I used to write a forty to seventy-five million dollar check into Series B to D companies. Um, oftentimes, the companies that we spent the most time on were ones where we had deep relationships with the the seed or Series A investors. And so, you know, roles have now reversed. I am the seed or Series A investor. And I try to drive a lot of communication up, uh, upstream, downstream, whichever way you want to call it, um, to the folks that I think can make those investments. Because, you know, uh, there's a lot of ego in our business. And I think one thing that really happens quickly is uh, people like to uh, people like to have attribution for companies, right? So if I found the company, I'm just inherently a little more excited about it. Um, whereas if someone showed it to me, it's kind of, uh, I'm not sure, like, you know, may, may, maybe not a good fit here. So I try to make sure that we've spent six, 12, sometimes 18 months introducing this company, giving that investor the chance to watch it, see if it executes, see if it does the things that it says it's going to do so that when that opportunity comes, they actually feel super familiar with the business. And it's not just a, hey, here's one of my series A companies that's raising, you should take a look. And so that's been a relationship building exercise that I think has actually been um, super fruitful. That's the glass half full answer. Um, the glass half empty answer is a lot of what Monique said, which is just, um, unfortunately, we don't have a lot of capital allocators that can stroke 10 to $20 million checks at the Series B who look like the three of us. And so being mindful of that and making sure that we continue um, to drive opportunity for fund managers that can focus in that space and, and want to focus in that space um, is super important and I think is a, is a, is a next evolution. Um, you're seeing percolation of seed, pre-seed. Series A managers, I think the next evolution is managers at, the, at that stage, as well as funds funds in, in, in our stages starting to have opportunity funds and starting to have other vehicles that can do that work, right? Look at the evolution of a majority of the funds that you see that are 500 plus million of AUM today. They probably started as a seed fund and found their way into later stages as they looked for opportunities to drive ownership in their in their high potential outcomes. And so I see similar paths for a lot of the early stage managers that that look like us today. Unfortunately, with with the AUM that we have, it's it's hard to write ten to fifteen million dollar checks. But um, glass half full again, that that day will come, and and we'll be able to to drive those opportunities. Yeah, I, I appreciate the balanced approach. I, I agree. I think we're far from where we need to be, but uh, I'm also uh, excited by looking at funds like y'all's and others um, within and outside the inside portfolio that are going to continue to grow and scale and, and see that continue of capital kind of continue to emerge. Um, I want to pivot back to something you were talking about, uh, mentioned Brian, but it was just around like the role and what, what is the job of the fund manager, right? Obviously, everybody kind of sees what's on Twitter. They see the fundraising part. They know you do deals, but they don't understand that you're running a small business, right? You have, <laughs> sometimes you have employees, you got to get insurance, you got all these different um, elements that you have to manage. And so I'd love to just kind of quickly get an overview of what that is like on a day-to-day -day basis. But specifically, I want to hear how y'all are thinking about building the culture within your organizations and just not only with those that are staffed or venture partners that are involved, but also within your portfolio. Um, and, and where does that kind of fall in the hierarchy of uh, the responsibilities y'all have? Sure. Um, it falls very high. Um, I think a lot of this breaks without, without building strong culture. Um, you know, I, I think Aaron and I have been uh, very lucky and, and fortunate in our careers to have a ton of mentors. And so I'd say we practice what I call the mosaic theory. You know, we surround the firm with a ton of different people that could give us a lot of advice. And we take little pieces from each of them and then decide how to integrate it into the culture and, and competency of the firm that we want to build. And so I think that shows up in the diversity of our of our LP base. Um, we have an endowment, we have foundations, we have venture capital firms like Insight, we have corporations, we have family offices, we have individuals. You know, we believe that learning from a variety of different types of LPs can help us structurally understand 
how to build a firm instead of just a fund. Um, I think there's also just an element of recognizing that we're doing this for the first time and being honest about that. Um, Aaron has built, a, you know, a, 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 he built a 200 person business at, at Blavity's scaled multiple organizations within it, et cetera. Um, but he's never built a venture capital firm and neither have I. And so we really try to spend time with folks on fund three, on fund seven, on fund 12, to really just understand the evolution of what it takes to get a firm to that size. Um, you know, this is in, in many ways a war of attrition. Um, it is very, very difficult in our business to get to fund three, to get to fund four. And so, um, you know, absent returns, which won't show up for six or seven years, um, TV, TVPI is a little dead today. You know, you can talk about your, your paper markups all you want, but the reality is you're going to need to build a firm in order to get out to those later, those later years. And so I think that building a culture and having employees that are excited to be part of the long-term journey is super relevant and super important and, and is super top of mind for us. Um, we were in LA uh, last week at our, at our summer offsite with our entire team. We're, we're 14 folks now on the team and, and growing. And, um, you know, I, I, I yearn, I, I sort of miss the days where I could just sit on Crunchbase or, or LinkedIn or, or, you know, go on three hour hikes with founders. And, and my only job was to source. Um, but it's not my job anymore, or at least it's not my only job as a GP. And so constantly recognizing that I have to intercept myself into the different components of the business and keeping that top of mind is something that I just learned from other GPs who have done it for a really long time, who sort of stress the importance of building out a firm and not just the fund to me. I appreciate that and appreciate the, the framing of building up this firm and, and the people that are involved in it as well. Uh, Monique, yours is a different case in that you're a solo GP, right? And so how do you think about managing those responsibilities, but also just balancing all the, the different pulls on your time? Yeah, I mean, I started Cake Ventures as a solo GP, but with the eye toward not being a solo GP forever and building out um, a really strong bench. And so, you know, a lot of what I spend time thinking about is team building. Um, you know, the culture is very important to Cake Ventures. Um, you know, demographic change is rooted in, in cultures. And as a solo GP firm, like the culture starts with like your personal culture, right? And how do you expand that to one person and two people and then on and on and on. Um, you know, I've recently brought on a venture partner. So I'm not just one person. So I, mean, I am a solo GP, but not just one person anymore. Um, and it's really important to try, to try to get the right fits. So team building is probably the thing that is very top of mind right now. And you asked about sort of the jobs that go beyond investing. Investing is like the top of the iceberg that you're able to see, right? But then there's, you know, there's managing the companies and supporting the companies. And then there's the operations and then there's the reporting. And then, you know, there's, um, you know, what software do we use? And so the job of a GP and a solo GP in particular is so multi-layered. You know, at any one point day, I'm like putting on and taking off four or five different hats. Um, and I think it's really important to have really strong support systems around you. Um, I have a really strong LP base, you know, um, a lot of LPs who have done this before and invested in, you know, great solo GP led firms. Um, Sindana is one of my LPs, Foundry is another. Um, they have really been really strong supporters of, of me as a solo GP and have really kind of helped accelerate my learning of what to do and not to do um, as I build out the firm. Uh, and I think that sort of thing is, is just really important, whether you're solo or not, is really trying, trying to find the people that you can lean into and lean on and ask questions of. And um, I, I would also say that Screen Door is a part of that, as is Insight Partners. Um, and so I think the way that you build your, your LP base can help you move faster and make fewer mistakes. <laughs> you will always make some mistakes, but you know the, the goal is to make fewer of them and recover faster. Um, and so I think that's really uh, the crux of the culture that we're building. I think I th just, Samer, one more thing I'll add, because uh, I'll shout it out since 
Monique and I are both in it. Um, we're part of what's called the Kaufman Fellowship. Um, and, and it's a community, you know, not everyone in it is a GP, but, you know, I think about um, when S when SVB had, had its moment, uh, Monique and I were in London. And so I was, it was 3 a.m. Aaron called me. He's like, yo, we need to get, we need to get a letter out. Like this bank is going, you know, we have a bunch of people we need to contact all this. It's 3 a.m. or I'm in London. Within two hours, I had six templates of a letter that was being sent to founders, seven templates of a letter that was being sent to LPs, was very quickly able to triangulate on where some of the best resources were for folks. Like that's the type of stuff that wasn't available five years ago, 10 years ago for emerging managers. And so I think that there's a world of resource uh, collaboration that's starting to show up where we recognize like it actually doesn't hurt you to share that type of thing, you know, and I, I think that that mentality is yeah. super important for us to uncover and sort of decrypt a little bit because um, I, I need Harlem Capital to raise fund five. I need 645 to be a billion of AUM. Like that's the mindset that I have in order for us to be successful instead of, you know, how do I steal one of their LPs? And I think that fortunately, that's a little bit of the mindset that's starting to show up a little a little more frequently. And, and I think that kind of double doubles down on the importance of community in a lot of these spaces, right? And community not kind of in this amorphous sense, but in this in this way of like meaningful relationships, people leaning into each other and supporting. Venture is innately a hyper competitive space, but you're not competing all the time, right? And in those yeah. opportunities where you can uh, leverage a connect, it can end up being value add for both. And, and I think Coffin is an incredible um, like program. And it's I just saw. A few other funds that uh, people that I was aware of that uh, got into this next cohort, which is awesome. Um, something both of y'all have been touching on that I want to double click into is just around the role of just like sponsorship, right? And so um, people being able to, you know, speak your name in rooms you're not in, give you that guidance that you talked about to avoid some of the mistakes that you could have made. What role has sponsorship, specifically in the fundraising process as well, played for y'all to help you kind of get through the, the slog because it's tough. It's, you know, it's just from, from watch outside looking in, I, I recognize how tough it is. And so we'd love to hear y'all's experiences with folks that have really helped you in that journey. And either one can jump in first. Yeah, I mean, one of my long-term mentors is Kate Mitchell, who started Scale Venture Partners. And she was one of the first people who sort of opened up her uh, Rolodex and introduced me to institutional level LPs and, um, you know, got me into the room to to speak to them about what I was building at Cake Ventures. And, you know, I think those people who can open doors and put you in the room um, are incredibly important. And then what you do in the room is is on you, but it's really important that you you're even able to get there. Um, and, you know, I think, I think the challenge for some people is finding that person. Um, I got to know Kate when she was at the National Venture Capital Association when she was on the board, I was still at 500 startups, uh, wasn't yet ready to start a fund, but we continued to keep a relationship. And so I think it's really all about continuing those relationships that you know will bear fruit in the in the long term and like truly creating relationships with people right not just being transactional but really you know deepening those relationships every opportunity that you can um kate was also you know a tremendous factor in me getting into coffin fellows and you know we just created this beautiful relationship over the years um and i hope that i can be that person for other people right because i know how important that was for me to have in my life. Um, so it's not just important for you to take that relationship from someone and, and, you know, move on, but also to try to like reach back and provide that for someone else. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I alluded to this a little earlier. I think Aaron and I have been very, very blessed in our careers to be surrounded by folks who have, have wanted us to succeed. I think one of the ways that we've done that is by reflecting on what makes a good mentee. Um, and so one of the things that I think we try, we, at least, you know, we, we're not always perfect, but one of the things we try to do is, um, when we, when we seek advice and when we receive advice, we try to go and execute on that advice and then circle back to that person with some version of proof that we took what they said and implemented it. Um, I'll give you an example for, for the fund. Josh Koppelman runs a fund called first round capital. 
Josh saw version one of the deck um, absolutely beat the crap out of our portfolio construction, the way we thought about making money, um, re really just destroyed it and made us start from scratch and really think about how we drive enterprise value for the firm. Um, why can he do that? Because he's on, you know, fund whatever, nine, 12, like he's just been doing it for a long time. He understands how the math of this game works. And so I think, you know, finding and identifying people that can do that work for you <clears throat> allows you to come back to them, show them that you've done it, and then gives them the authority to go out and confidently put your name in front of other people because they trust that you're not going to embarrass them. Right. It's really hard right now to just say, Hey, let me know if you know any LP. LPs aren't, aren't, aren't looking for new intros right now to funds they've never met. They're looking for authentic, you know, opportunities to meet people that they know through other people trust and admire. And so I think that we've done a good job of using, um, using time to our advantage, one, setting relationships ahead of where we need capital from LPs, but two, just demonstrating execution of the advice that we receive from folks, because I think that it helps drive trust um, with with the champions that you're referencing. Mm -hmm. Those are both really important takeaways. Uh, and I think just things that I'll log to just how do you be a good mentee, not just a good mentor, right? And, and yeah. be able to receive and act on that information. And we, we all we all want mentees. good mentees, but none of us want to be good mentees. And so you know I, I think I think I think a lot <laughs> I think a lot about the reversal of that role and saying, you know, what makes a good mentee for that champion that you're referencing. You know, Hillary Gosher, I'll, I'll shout her out as well at Insight. You know, Hillary was our champion and our sponsor at Insight. The the vehicle was barely built, you know, for for us to to um get a shot at Insight was was really instrumental and you know, the signal that having insight as an LP has driven for the firm has has been monumental. And Feline and Claire and some of the folks that really championed us within within the org to say, hey, you know, these guys haven't even had a first close yet, but we think that they're doing some really interesting stuff. It really was catalytic to 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 the firm building and 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 fundraise process for us. So having those folks on the inside that believe in you is 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 critical. Definitely, definitely. And, and good shout out for Hillary. Um uh I'd love to just final question before we wrap up, and it's something both of y'all kind of alluded to as being fund one managers is, is just kind of this idea of imposter syndrome, right? And questioning, am I doing this job right? The feedback loop is so long, you won't know for a few years. How do y'all manage that kind of constant? Or maybe it's not constant for y'all. Y'all got a stronger will than me, but that, uh, <laughs> that challenge of like, am I doing this right? Am I actually good at this job? Is this the thing that's right for me? Uh, curious how, you, how y'all navigate it. Brian, I saw you come off mute, so love to hear what you think. Um, yeah, you know, I, I I don't talk about this too much, but there's you know there's a there's a cross sitting under this this black shirt. Um, I'm a, a man of faith. Um, I believe in doing good work and and trying to just be a servant to to other people. Um, I've done it my entire career. I've tried to open doors. I've tried to kick down doors in a lot of situations for people that come behind me. You know, I've been very fortunate to go to two of the best schools in the world in, in Stanford and Harvard. And I worked at a phenomenal tier one um, investment bank at Goldman Sachs. You know, I, I've been put in some incredible rooms and I, I fully recognize that a lot of other people might not get those opportunities. But um, if I can bring resources and shed light on some of the things that I learn in those spaces and, and share them with other people, um, that fills my cup. And, and if I wake up in 10 years and the LP world tells me I'm not good at this job, um, I have a feeling I will have at least created some opportunities for some folks along the way. And that drives me to kind of wake up every Monday and get from 300 to inbox zero. Um, yeah, I mean, sometimes I wouldn't even call that imposter syndrome. That is just, you know, being on a path of learning to do your job. Yeah. Um you know, sometimes it's not imposter syndrome. Sometimes you are just not fully formed yet. Um, and we, you know, as people hopefully will not be fully formed because we'll constantly be learning something. Um, and to walk into a learning environment and try not to have a chip on your shoulder so big that you can't walk through the door is really important, right? Um, so that you can learn from whoever is there to teach you the thing. Um, you know, I I think my network at Kaufman has been really helpful in some of the challenges and, and things that I've gone through with raising the fund and deploying the capital. Um, you know, there are always times where you feel like you're not doing enough, you're failing, 
um, especially if you are high achieving, uh, you know, straight A students. <laughs> like this is this is not a job for like getting straight A's all the time. Um, you know, companies will fail, and you are going to fail at supporting companies. Well, hopefully, you don't fail at supporting companies, but you will fail at getting companies to that next milestone because that's the way that portfolios work. Um, but it's, I think it's really important to find ways to hopefully not internalize those kinds of failures and to, you know, keep moving on to the next thing and the next thing and the next thing in order to build something that is really, um, you know, lasting and long lasting and, and game changing and to feel that within yourself, like to build a life that is, that is game changing. So, so much of our job is, uh, hearing no, I think that's a, that's a new thing for a lot of folks as part of that anecdote of, you know, everyone wants a fund till they get one. I, I think the journey of fund one in particular, it's remarkable how many times you hear no, um, and learning how to recognize and sort of be at peace with no is a challenge and something that I've certainly, um, you know, to get off the fourth no and still get on a fifth call as if you didn't hear that. Uh, is is very challenging. And so I think learning how to do that and surrounding yourself with encouragement is uh, is is another way that I think I've tackled some of that imposter syndrome and just recognizing that, uh, you know, ha holding comfort in the belief that um, the only thing worse than that no would be that person saying yes and not believing in you. And so identifying a, a group of LPs who truly do believe in in us and what we're building is is what is what allows me to get off those calls and still have the ambition to keep going. I appreciate that. I, I took a lot from that. I think one is uh, to Monique's point, reframing. Right, uh, you're just in a constant state of learning. Right, and yesterday will be worse than today, but tomorrow will be better. And so, kind of continuously being on that journey, and then wrapping yourselves around a north star, whether it's community to lean on, whether it's faith. Um, just kind of using that to keep you pushing, putting one step in front of the, in front of the other, and then you wake up and you're fun 12, right? Um, and so I know we're pressing up right on time. Um, Monique, Brian, thank you both so much just for spending the time with us today, sharing your insights, just sharing your experience. Uh, really proud and excited to have y'all in the portfolio and to, and to know y'all personally. And um, yeah, just thank you again for joining us today. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Take care. Have a good one. Thank you everybody for joining as well.